Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I am Billy Embody. Thanks for listening. We've got a lot to get to. SMU is back to winning football games, beating Navy on Friday night, 40 to 34, in a game that, quite honestly, was a lot clo- was a, was a lot more lopsided, in my opinion, than the than the score might indicate. So we'll cover some of that. We'll cover how SMU was able to get back in the win cl- column and now sit at one and one in AAC play. We'll also talk a little recruiting on this edition of the podcast as well. Um, was out to see Brandon Miazono uh, last week, and SMU lost a a uh, football commitment. So we'll cover a lot of that. Let's jump in, though. SMU races out to a 13-0 lead. Looks like kind of a a similar game, in a sense, to the UCF game. SMU had a lead. Probably should have been bigger, but they weren't able to uh, hold it either. Uh, You know, kind of going into the early part of the second half as Navy made it 14-13. Kind of a controversial uh, way that the midshipmen were able to take uh, really their 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 first and only lead of the ball game um, with that um, kind of penalty that was enforced the right way, but you know something just doesn't sit right about it. So they get the holding call on the punt uh, after the punt was away. If you go back and watch it, they did a good job replaying it, and I think it was Kavaris Hall. I could be wrong. Sorry if I, I, I got that wrong, uh, Katie, but you have somebody who's tied up after the punts away and both players tussle to the ground pretty much. The ref throws the flag. It's probably the right call in a sense, but then the ruling results in Navy picking up a first down. After the punt's already away, it has zero impact on the offense moving the ball forward uh, and, and potentially gaining a first down. Instead, Navy takes it, continues to drive down the field, and they end up scoring to make it 14-13 uh, with 11-13 to play in the third quarter. From there, SMU ripped off 21 unanswered points uh, and really outscored the midshipmen 28-7 over the next, let's call it, uh, pretty much 15 minutes of football. Uh, and the Mustangs were able to, to kind of cruise from there. I know it got a little dicey late in the game. Navy scored uh, with 231 to go. SMU got the ball back. They bled the clock. Uh, down pretty much to, uh, I believe it was around a minute uh, 40 or so. Uh, 113 actually is, is, or no, yeah, about a minute 30 left in the ball game when Navy took over on that drive. They score, the onside kick goes SMU's way, and the game's over. So obviously Navy could have uh, certainly won the game on a Hail Mary if they had recovered that onside kick. So don't get me wrong, it was a little hairy. But in terms of controlling the football game, I felt like SMU was in complete control pretty much the entire time, even as Navy was able to take a 14-13 lead. They got the ball uh, after the half, um, you know, took the, took the ball to start the second half. You just kind of felt like, all right, if SMU is able to punch it into the end zone more consistently in the second half than they did, let's say, in the first half, going with uh, two field goals and a touchdown, you know, this game isn't really close. And that was you know, similar, in a sense, to the UCF game. If SMU is able to punch it in on their – First drive uh, to open the game that resulted in a Colin Rogers field goal. You're sitting there 14 nothing uh, with just seven minutes left in the first quarter. Uh, that's a really strong start. Maybe Navy doesn't get off the mat as much. Colin Rogers' 46 yard field goal, though, I think that was a really important kick, not only for him, that's a big confidence booster for a young freshman, but it also strategically for SMU. You know, 46 yarder, that's no joke. Uh, it would have been good from a little bit longer. That has to give Rhett Lashley a little bit more um, faith in his freshman kicker to kick a uh, kick like that. And I think for the most part, SMU just really dictated the tempo. They dictated what they wanted Navy to do. Navy had to throw the ball a good bit. I know the secondary obviously you know, didn't have its best game. You know, Giving up 138 yards passing to Navy is not something that you normally see or want to do. But uh, they did only complete 43% of their passes. There really wasn't too much in terms of the passing game overall that really got out of hand. But the run game, SMU was able to limit uh, in a really, I think, impressive fashion, you know, limiting them to 200 to 372 rush yards, 
on 101 plays, that is, I mean, that's terrific. You know, it really is. You know, Navy, despite not having the rush offense that they normally have, is coming off a game where they rush for 455 yards. SMU did allow them to play 101 total plays. I mean, that's just kind of how it is, unfortunately. Uh, but SMU was really impressive on third down. If you look at it through the quarters, uh, through three quarters of play, this is where SMU was up. Uh, they were up. Uh, let's see what the scoring was heading into the third or heading into the fourth. It was 33-20 or no, it was 33-14 heading into the fourth quarter. Navy scored uh, early to make it 33-20. to SMU scored relatively early in that fourth quarter as well. If you look at it by comparison, though, uh, through the third quarter, SMU had given up 319 total yards, uh, 285 on the ground. So really in the fourth quarter, only gave up 87 uh, they gave up 110 yards passing in the fourth as Navy tried to come back. But their third downs were four for 12. That's 33%. SMU only had six third downs at that point um, and, and, you know, finished 50% in that category through three quarters. SMU had 371 total yards, averaging a really impressive yards per, per play at 10.3. That kind of went down in the fourth quarter as SMU was kind of running it. Um, and trying to bleed the clock a little bit. And just overall, SMU was in complete control. Uh, they really were. You know, Navy, you know, had to pass, try to come back at that point. Uh, they converted some some third downs. You can kind of tell they weren't picking up uh, as many chunk plays. Um, from what I saw, they only averaged 5.3 yards per play uh, in the fourth quarter, which was a little bit different than their 4.9 yards per play through the first three quarters, they obviously got some plays in the passing game. They were obviously seven of 10 on third downs. That's telling me SMU is making them earn every inch of that uh, field, which look, I mean, you want SMU to get off the field. I'm not going to sit here and say that their defense was stellar in the fourth, but that by that point, they played 65 plays through three quarters. They played 36 in the fourth. So think about that. Uh, really incredible. The time of possession, 924 to 536 in the fourth, that your defense is just going to be gassed. I mean, they are. It's not it, It's not an excuse. It's reality. Um, Navy obviously hit some things, but SME also made them earn it. You know, the passing game for Navy really came alive. Uh, they hit some big plays in that pass game. Um, you know, they went 6 to 17 in the passing game in the fourth quarter uh, and were able to uh, – you know, total 104 yards through the air. So it's nothing really incredible, uh, you know, in terms of big plays being given up in that fourth quarter in the past game. And I just think you look at the job Scott Simons and his group did. I think that group played so hard. You know, Stefan Wright uh, had a really good game. Um, you had Mike Johan, Sanjo, and Jiki in the game. You had Elijah Chapman. You had Devere Leveston. We didn't see Jalen Samuels. It's worth noting. Uh, we did not see him. He did not play. Uh, he's somebody that we talked to on Tuesday, looked like he was going to play. Don't know if something happened or if it was a scheme thing. Jaden Jones had a good game, forced a big fumble that Nick Roberts uh, collected. Um, and then Isaac Slade Matutia had a big game while Jimmy Phillips went down early on. So, uh, And I think Nick Roberts had a good game. So look at what the, the defense was able to do. I think they really forced Navy to earn a lot of things. They gave up some they, – they had some lapses. End of the first half, that was a bad lapse. I didn't like that one at all. Um, you know, Navy was able to take advantage and hit some hit some big plays um, in the passing game. Uh, that touchdown that they scored was not necessarily anything you want to see given up. You know they're, they've kind of got a pass. They're under the gun uh, for the most part to, uh, to try and uh, score before the half. They're on the SMU 24-yard uh, line, so – you got to know kind of a pass is coming in a way. Navy's just not going to be able to kind of turn it down the field. They've got to take a chance. 24-yard touchdown pass uh, goes for a touchdown. And then in the third quarter, SMU did gave up, uh, give up a 26-yard touchdown pass as well. Um, and then late in the fourth, two plays on that final drive uh, that they had, 34 yards uh, and 17 yards in the air. Uh, again, just not kind of – not what you want to see, but I, I feel like SMU was able to limit it. For the most part, I mean, we really didn't see much at all uh, throughout the game. They had, you know, what amounted to two explosive passing plays over the course of the first three quarters. Um, and they, you know, had that um, 
uh, had the two late in the game, uh, which you don't want to see. I mean, especially in a passing situation and especially when SMU was doing a good job making Navy kind of eat like up every bit of field late in the game as they could have. Um, I'll say this, Brian Massey, he had a tough game. He's still tied for the uh, team lead in tackles. He tackled high. It was obvious he's not right now 100%. He called it 98% this week, but I think he's more in that 80% range. And he missed all of fall camp basically with those fundamentals. Uh, He missed much of the, you know, early goings of the season. And he's got he's having to play his way back into shape and play his way back into game speed. And obviously, when you're not at 100 percent, you play a game against a team like Navy. That's going to be difficult uh, just in general. I mean, you don't see it very often. And uh, SMU, uh, you know, needs him at 100 percent against Cincinnati. He's probably not going to be 100 percent. But at least in this case, he's probably going to be in a little bit better situation as far as, you know, what you're defending, what you're being asked to do. Um, so, look, I, I thought SMU's defense had a really good plan. Obviously, losing somebody like Jimmy Phillips hurts, uh, but you can tell the depth on the defensive line with it being healthy. Uh, we'll wait and hear what, what's going on with uh, Jalen Samuels or if it was just a, uh, you know, matchup thing. But that defensive line really played hard. I mean, they they just brought it, and I think they've got to be commended for it. Um, you know, I posted on the board, talking with people around the program, they felt pretty good about the game going in. Uh, and they felt like they had prepared really well and the players were in a really good mindset. And, you know, I think that showed. Um, so they came out, built a 13 nothing lead offensively. Tanner Mordecai was great once again. Uh, got an AAC honor roll mention this week. 20 of 27, 336 yards, three touchdowns, um, and also had a 60-yard touchdown run. Look, we've said it that Tanner Mordecai has some wheels. And uh, Coach Griswold who posted on his Instagram that I think Tanner was cooking about a 21 21- uh, mile per hour run on that 60 yard touchdown. So uh, he's got some wheels. Uh, this game, he put his head down and ran. I don't know if he's a podcast listener or if the coaches made the adjustments or all three, but uh, you know, F- everybody was on the same page. Tanner Mordecai, take it, run. They had the nice zone read. I think that was a terrific call. He went right down the middle of the field and, and outran everyone for that touchdown. He was close to having a second touchdown because he put his head down and ran and took off. Uh, that's what SMU needs from Tanner Mordecai. Those, ch- those, I mean, first of all, 60 yard touchdown run is terrific. You'll take that all day, but those chunks of yards that he was able to pick up were critical and they were great decisions by him to run. So great game by Tanner Mordecai. SMU had nearly 500 yards of offense, despite only having 48 plays, 9.2 yards per play. That's what you want. And factor this in, you know, Calvin Wiggins drops what would have been a touchdown pass. I'd have to go back and really find it to see when that play happened, if it would have led to a touchdown. I'm not sure if it did or didn't, Um, but uh, you want to see him make that grab. I mean, he ran right down the middle. He ran a good route. Tanner Mordecai put it on him uh, and he can't hold it in, haul it in. And, you know, unfortunately for him, that's kind of been the name of, you know, kind of his career and what's kept him off the field uh, a lot. But um, Ben Redding had had a drop. That would have been a first down. Mordecai really fired that one in there, but um, you know, had had some space to make the catch, wasn't necessarily in a position where he was, you know, being thrown into a big, big hit or anything like that. But Dylan Goffney stepped up, led SMU receivers with four catches, 116 yards, uh, and a touchdown. That's what we kind of saw out of him coming out of uh, Cypress Bridgeland, um, you know, a couple years years ago. Really productive player who just kind of does the little things right. And he caught the ball, he made plays. Credit to him for sticking in there and and you know, knowing that his, his time could come. Um, and I think he, him stepping up is very, very important for this offense. That's a huge confidence booster for Tanner Mordecai to throw it to him. Jordan Curley, three catches, 62 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Rasheed Rice, three catches, 74 yards, um, including a big 68 yarder to start. So kind of quiet night for him. I don't know what the coverage was doing, but look, you know, people, it was a quiet night for the tight ends. Uh, RJ McDan- uh, RJ Maryland, uh, had one catch for three minus three yards, but you had Moochie Dixon had two catches for 44 yards. Uh, you had uh, Roger Daniels Jr. in his return, scoring a touchdown, the last touchdown of the night. That's got to be special. Your first game back, you just lost your dad and you score. That is why he should have stuck around the first time, quite honestly. I understand what he went through, wanted more of an opportunity, but that Jake Bailey was always a play away from getting hurt. And Roger Daniels was a play away from getting some more um, 
opportunities and he took advantage of it. 27 yard touchdown. Uh, I feel great for him. That's awesome. And SMU overall got what it's, what, what it's been needing, which is its receivers to step up around Rasheed Rice. Um, I mean, you look at what Tanner Mordecai did completing 74% of his passes. You look at those two drops I mentioned, that would have been 22 of 27. I mean, you're just really sitting in a good spot overall um, if you're SMU in terms of where your passing game is going into this Cincinnati matchup. Now, on the flip side, the run game is not there. I don't know what's going on with Belton Gardner. Again, a guy that looked good on Tuesday. We'll see as we go out this week if he's out there. Um, and obviously, we let you guys know on the on the Pony Express message boards, if you're a subscriber, that Trey Siggers, there was just no way he was going to play. He might not play against Cincinnati, um, but they definitely need to rest him for the Navy game. Uh, he was limping around pretty good at practice. So we'll continue to monitor his status. But, all right, Tyler Levine, 4.7 yards per carry, uh, five rushes for uh, 17 yards is not really going to get it done. That's about three yards a carry. And then he had an 11 yard carry. So he finished with six rushes for 28 yards for the most part, though, average around three yards a carry. Kamar Wheaton, three touches, five yards. Um, TJ McDaniel finishes four carries, zero total yards. And I, I think, you know, it just is what it is at this point. And, and Navy has a really good rush defense and they make things hard on you. And, you know, I don't think Marcus Bryant ended up playing the whole game, but um, you, you you can't really, you know, have a, a a performance like like that and and you know feel good about it. You just can't. And I know they only ran, you know, forty eight plays, and Tanner Mordecai was incredible, and he was a part of the rushing attack, which I think is important to note. Like you have Tanner Mordecai who tucked it. Teams now have to have to respect that a little bit more. And that could help. Navy is a really good run defense. But to total 33 yards out of your three running backs is not great. And it, there's no way around it. I think the offensive line needs to continue to get better, find a way. Uh, but it's going to be hard. It's just uh, until Velton Gardner and, and Trey Sigers are back in that rotation and 100%, I think we've seen kind of what SMU's run game is probably going to be for the most part this season. Um, and they've got to find ways to create more space or uh, have an extension of the run game or, or do different things. And I thought they kind of tried to do that with the jet sweeps. We saw a couple go uh, against Navy. They had very limited success, but I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to open up things a little bit horizontally um, and, and make them respect that kind of a stretch the field, you know, horizontally a little bit more. So maybe some of those creases up the middle, um, if you do some of that action later on, we'll give you some running lanes. So I don't mind what SMU is doing at all with the jet flips and the jet sweeps. I think that's it's a play that's in this offense, and I, I think it's a good one. And when you hit it, you hit it big. Um, they haven't had much success with it, but one of these guys at some point is going to break it. I mean, they're just too talented. Um, so you look at the running backs, they're trying. They ran hard. I didn't think there was anything really to, to you know be negative about in that in that sense, but it's just not the exp most explosive group right now by any means. And uh, they kind of are what they are at this point. I thought the offensive line did a terrific job. Uh, Tanner Mordecai not sacked. Um, and, you know, they only had, uh, Navy only had five tackles for loss on the night. So that's pretty good. I, I feel like, you know, SMU didn't lose any fumbles. Uh, they had two that they put on the ground. They didn't lose any, um, but you know, the defense was opportunistic with uh, Slade Matutia's interception. They were able to recover a huge uh, fumble. When they forced that fumble, that was massive. Um, and overall, I, I think this was a game that you just kind of had to get through. You know, people want to talk about the stats and giving up 510 total yards, 372 on the ground. And SMU's rush defense has not been good this season. It hasn't. And I'm not trying to argue that it is or it's, or it's impressive or whatever, but you have a rush defense that – Force Navy to run 101 plays. Their yards per carry average was not that impressive. It was under five. Um, and you you kind of had forced them to try and beat you through the air in a way. I think the, the, the close score, and obviously, look, if you're better, I mean, oh God, I feel bad, all those things. But Navy is a team that just doesn't stop. 
I thought the effort from SMU was terrific all night. I really do. Uh, the defense was absolutely playing as hard as it could. Could I think there are things they need to clean up. Obviously, you take a look at the Navy film and you see some of the things that just generally you need to clean up, but you can't really apply a lot of it just because it's triple option. Like Ryan Massey's got to work on his fundamentals tackling. There's no question about that. Uh, defensive backs, you still want to see a little bit better effort on some of those plays in terms of the execution that gave up the big plays, especially late in that first half. That's a drive that I think kind of might eat at Scott Simons a little bit. But overall, screw the stats when, it's, when it comes to Navy. I mean, honestly, I, and you come away with a win. You know, I know there are things that they need to improve on, but it's really difficult uh, to beat them. Tulsa showed that. Um, East Carolina showed that. There's still a Navy team that's very average. I mean, I'm not, this is not a Navy team that is, I think they're probably, you know, they could very well be headed to miss a bowl, but they're still very difficult to defend. They can beat you at any time. And if you don't bring your A game and you don't bring your A effort, you're not going to beat them. And SME brought their A effort, you know, finishing in the red zone, still something you want to see a little bit better uh, job of, uh, but SMU really went two for two on that front, um, and they just controlled the game. I, I said it on the board. It just felt like SMU was in control, even as Navy fought back and ended up going up 14-13. I just felt like this was a game SMU was really in control of, and I know it can be frustrating at times, but you take this win, you move on. In terms of this week, you've got Cincinnati, very difficult opponent for the most part, also beatable. You know, we've seen USF take them – you know, all the way uh, to the end and really kind of you know, put them in a, uh, you know, a close one. Um, we know that uh, Desmond Ritter is not quarterbacking this group again. Uh, they beat Tulsa 31-21. Navy just beat the hell out of uh, Tulsa. So, you know, where, where does that put, um, you know, SMU in the transitive property? But they've also gone on the road. They've played Arkansas tough. Um, Arkansas probably isn't as good as I thought they were going to be this year. They're sitting outside the top 25. Um, and then they obviously took care of business against Indiana. So they've kind of had a mixed bag this season. If you're a Bearcats fan and going to try to get our buddy, Brandon Seho to come on uh, the podcast as well this week, as we pretty much always do and, and chat a little bit about that matchup uh, coming up. But um, we'll talk more about that later this week. Um, I do want to say uh, I think SMU just needed to, get through that uh, game and, and kind of go from there. Um, it, it, I think the last three weeks just ate at a lot of these guys in different ways, whether it's missed opportunities and you, you're, you're hurt, you're, you're beating yourself up over not having one of these three wins that they could have had um, or just the fact that it's Navy. So uh, SMU, by the way, really good crowd for Friday night. I was very impressed by it. Um, and SMU was able to, you know, move on and, and, and get the win. And they know they're not perfect. They know that they can't rest on their laurels by any means this week. Uh, they've got Cincinnati and then they've got Tulsa and then they've got Houston and, and, uh, it goes on, uh, without a doubt. But, um, I think this is a win that, that people are going to look back and, you know, we'll see kind of where the team goes from here. If they can, you know, nab one of these wins against the Cincinnati, Houston, and Memphis. Great. We're obviously going to look back at this whole season and, and say, look, I think that Navy win was was a gutty one. It's a, it's a hard one to do. Um, and, and I think SMU just had to find a way to get through it. And they did. A uh, lot of things to clean up. We'll talk about that after we talked with the coaches on Tuesday and Wednesday. And we preview the Cincinnati game. But I want to shift gears, talk a little recruiting. Uh, first, I want to lead off with uh, the news that Richter Connolly, seminal two-way offensive, well, mainly offensive lineman for SMU, decommitted from the Mustangs. Uh, on Sunday, I believe it was. And this is an interesting one. So Rick Connolly, first of all, I was really high on him. am really high on him. One of the best shot put throwers in uh, Texas state qualifier. He was committed for a while. He committed on the same day as Reagan Gill, a really high upside prospect. But look, I, I think sometimes there are bigger things at play. I've heard he wants to be close to his girlfriend. He said in his tweet he wants to throw at the next level. SMU doesn't have a formal track team. He could have thrown on his own. But, you know, he wants to go chart another course. I don't think that involves 
him ending up at a, a fairly high level of football at this point. Uh, we'll continue track and see where he ends up. Uh, and maybe he his, his senior film really wows and power five with a throwing program and all those things comes along and, and, you know, brings him on board. But right now I think this is a, you know, more of a well thought out decision that just isn't going to go SMU's way in the end. They really liked him. They were high on him. Uh, they still got Reagan Gill committed. They've still got Sean Scott out of California and they still have uh, Alex Woods out of the state of Florida in this offensive line class that spans literally coast to coast. So, um, and I know that the staff especially is really high on Sean Scott right now and what they've seen uh, from his senior tape, a guy that really, really flies under the radar uh, and added a Cal offer uh, earlier this year based on the start of his senior year. So Richter Connolly decommits. That hurts. SMU probably will fill his spot at some point with a transfer or uh, maybe even a JUCO because they still need numbers on the offensive line. There are some guys on this roster. They just have to keep kind of churning a little bit uh, to get this group to where it needs to be because it's not there yet. Um, and so we'll continue to monitor where they go from here on the offensive line. It's probably a longer term search uh, if they go JUCO or if they go transfer. So Richter Connolly uh, decommits from SMU over the weekend. That leaves SMU sitting with 15 commits in the class of 2023. They now rank fourth in the AAC, uh, dropping behind uh, Houston uh, for uh, the on three consensus team recruiting rankings uh, based on, you know, the average uh, there. SMU just dropped off. But according to on three, SMU sits third in the conference uh, with an 85 average. So we'll call it SMU sits third in the conference as far as the 2023 class. Speaking of which, I went and saw Brandon Maizano play Frisco versus Frisco Heritage. Uh, and let me tell you, I picked quite the night. Uh, Scott Simons was in attendance. Uh, we were in the star, big stage, big, big, uh, you know, local rivalry and uh, both really good teams. But tempers flared, uh, I think, late in the first quarter, maybe early second quarter. And uh, Brandon Maizano was among... I think probably eight to 10 players and a couple coaches that were ejected on both sides. So here's what I saw. Uh, I think it's pretty accurate. Just my opinion. Heritage people are, you know, in Frisco, people aren't going to like it one way or the other. But look, it was a chippy game to start. I felt like there was a little bit of, you know, this and that after the whistle a lot. Uh, run along the Frisco Heritage sideline results in a, a skirmish and then Basically, look, it was on the Heritage bench and pretty much the whole Heritage team came over to defend whatever was going on. Brandon Mazzano was in on the tackle. A couple others were in on the tackle over there. Um, and ultimately, uh, it, it really spilled out onto the field. Uh, Frisco coaches ran over trying to defuse the situation. Well, I would say Frisco coaches ran over, uh, tried to get involved, get their players out of there, um, do all the things you're taught to do in a situation like that. And it ended up getting into it with the coaches. A couple of coaches really got into some shoving matches. Some players on both sides were going after coaches on other sides. It was uh, it was quite the scene, and I hadn't been in one of those in a minute. So uh, anyway, Brandon Manzano gets ejected. Look, one, we've seen Jamari and Carroll uh, get tossed or be in a situation where he had to defend his team. Brandon Manzano has now done it. I, I liked it. I mean, from what I saw from Brandon Manzano, captain – of his team, uh, very, I would say, uh, involved in the game, both offensively and defensively. He was always there, always standing next to his head coach. Hey, do I need to go in on offense? Um, do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? Uh, very physical, active player, made a couple really good tackles. We posted the clips on the PonyExpress.com for you guys uh, and on our YouTube page. Please subscribe to our YouTube page if you haven't already. Um, and, and look, I mean, that's just the limited clips I got, but he was on pace to having a really nice night, especially on defense, which he's been able to play a lot more defense this year because they made a switch uh, to a younger player at quarterback where they're letting kind of run the show in their pro style attack. Um, I was really, really impressed actually with Jordan Hamilton, uh, 2023 running back from Frisco, uh, who also got injected. Unfortunately, he had a uh, punt return for a touchdown, had another big play. Uh, again, was looking like he had a huge night. Frisco comes away with the win. Look, tempers flare. I think it was, I mean, I think they had to eject some of the guys. There's no doubt. And they ejected, ended up ejecting Heritage's quarterback. Basically all the guys that pretty much had remotely offers um, on some level all got ejected. So um, that game kind of took a turn, obviously. And 
Uh, you know, but Frisco came away with the win. I came away impressed with Brandon Manzano. He's going to show up in January, and SMU's really high on him. Uh, they scouted him. They like what they see. They think he's going to be a very physical linebacker, and you can see that when you play his uh, play his tape. I don't know how he'll fit in athletically. Uh, just from a verified numbers perspective, we just don't have that. But he looked to me like he tracks really well. He plays fundamentally sound. He's got a physical edge to him. I, I, I have to admit, I was impressed. So SMU, I think, has a little bit of a sleeper on their hands. They didn't necessarily – he's not somebody who's really picked up a ton in terms of offers, um, but he's very much locked into SMU. Um, he had a really good showing against Frisco Heritage in about a quarter-ish of work. So I um, want to say I was impressed by him. Uh, I'll be out this Thursday seeing Denton Geyer versus Allen, so a lot of prospects on both sides of that one to kind of keep an eye on. In the 2024 class, offensive lineman Willie Goodacre uh, on the Denton Geyer side. On Allen, they've got a couple every year, it seems like, um, as well as, um, and his name's escaping re me right now, um, and I'll try to uh, find him. Uh, but SMU did just offer uh, KV on Sibley out of Allen as well, so I'll get a chance to watch him. Uh, they offered him to kick off this month. Uh, he had a big showing. Uh, earlier this year, 217 yards, four touchdowns um, in a game. And that was pretty much right right before the offer. So you can kind of connect the dots there on that one. Uh, and then on Friday night, I'm planning on either going to Arlington Martin's game um, or going over to North Cali, Crowley to check out uh, their matchup. So that's it. Sit on the recruiting updates for the most part. We posted uh, some additional tidbits on the site for our subscribers. Check those out. And uh, Juco defensive back Ben Osiiki recaps his thoughts on the offer, where his recruitment stands as well. So be sure to check that out. Subscribe for free to get a seven-day trial. Uh, and then just a few bucks a month after that for on theponyexpress.com. You get all of our content. Uh, which pretty much all premium info, info injury updates, uh, player interviews, recruiting updates, all those things. Please, I appreciate all you guys who have subscribed to the On the Pony Express YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Tell your friends. I don't care if they watch a video. Uh, I would like them to watch a video, but we just need more subscribers to the page. Grow it. Tell your SMU friends. Please share it. Just say, hey, can you go like this page for me? Uh, so Billy will quit bothering us on the uh, podcast about it. And if you do that and grow it, really get this thing rolling. So um, excited about uh, another week on the site. We'll have a lot to uh, share with you guys as SMU plays host to Cincinnati, 11 a.m. on Saturday inside Ford Stadium. We'll be there with all your coverage. So hope you guys enjoyed this edition of the podcast. And uh, we will catch you guys later this week to uh, chat a little bit more about SMU Cincinnati. And we'll talk a little bit of hoops as well. So with that, hope you guys have a great rest of the week. And we'll catch you next time.